Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is the unloading valve. Our objective is to examine yet another member of the pressure control valve family, known as an unloading valve. Unloading valves are commonly used to divert pump flow at low pressures and contribute to the efficient operation of a larger hydraulic system. This lecture operates under the assumption you've watched the vented and remote control pressure relief valves, sequence valves, and pressure reducing valves lectures, all available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet, or only dimly recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. The unloading valve is just one of a larger family of pressure control valves. Recall during the hydraulic schematics lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we briefly discussed this family on an introductory level. Pressure control valves look and behave astoundingly similar to one another. Pressure control valves, as the name implies, do something when pressure reaches a certain value. Pressure control valves come in five main types. Pressure relief valves, sequence valves, counterbalance valves, pressure reducing valves, and unloading valves. When first introduced to this family in mass, you'll note they're hard to differentiate from one another. This being said, if you know what characteristics to look for, they're easy to distinguish and identify. The characteristics I use to classify them are as follows. Pilot line, deactivated state, whether the valve has a check valve bypass or not, whether the drain is internal or external, and finally, location and perceived function. This might be a review of this topic. However, repeat exposure to this topic is pretty helpful. Pilot line. All pressure control valves monitor pressure using a dashed pilot port. Sometimes the pilot line is internal to the valve or can be an external remote connection. Internal pilot lines can monitor the valve's input or primary port as in the case of a pressure relief valve and certain configurations of sequence and counterbalance valves, or the internal pilot line can monitor the valve's output or secondary port as in the case of pressure reducing valves. External or remote pilot lines can be found in the case of unloading valves and certain configurations of sequence and counterbalance valves. Deactivated state. All pressure control valves have a deactivated state. When pressure in the pilot line exceeds the adjustable set value, the valve actuates into its opposite state. Most of these valves are normally closed that open when pressure exceeds the set value and, for all intents and purposes, operate just like an ordinary pressure relief valve. The exception to this characteristic being the pressure reducing valve. Pressure reducing valves are normally open and when pressure exceeds the set value, the valve closes. That's a dead giveaway. Check valve bypasses. Some of these valves have check valve bypasses, some of them don't. The ones with check valve bypasses, like sequence, counterbalance, and pressure reducing valves, are designed to control pressure in one direction and then be bypassed in another. The ones without check valve bypasses, like pressure relief valves and unloading valves, are ordinarily employed in regions with unidirectional flow paths, rendering reverse operation a non-issue. Drain ports. Some of these valves necessitate external drains, some of them don't. The ones with external drains, like sequence and pressure reducing valves, have pressurized secondary ports. The ones with internal drains, like pressure relief, unloading, and counterbalance valves, are intended to operate with a secondary port at low pressure, rendering an external drain unnecessary. Location and perceived function. Finally, and most importantly, very often, the location of a pressure control valve is a dead giveaway about the valve's true nature. Pressure relief valves are always between the pump and the tank. Unloading valves are also known to loiter around the pump. However, they're easily distinguishable from pressure relief valves since their pilot passage isn't internal to the valve, but rather a remote external connection. Sequence valves hang out around the input of actuators, as do pressure reducing valves. They're distinguishable from each other since sequence valves are normally closed and pressure reducing valves are normally open. Counterbalance valves are the opposite. They hang around the output of actuators. If location and perceived functions still doesn't clue you in, sometimes the schematic includes specific port identifiers and goes to the trouble of directly referencing the valve in a legend. Long story short, anytime one of the pressure control valve quintuplets pop up, you should be able to run through the list. Pilot line, deactivated state, check valve bypass, drain, and location and perceived function, and check off as many identifiable characteristics as possible. Sooner or later, you'll hit upon which valve you're looking at. 
Let's see if we can classify an unloading valve, the topic of this particular lecture, using these characteristics. For all intents and purposes, unloading valves are just like pressure relief valves with one important modification. Unloading valves use an external or remote pilot line, whereas a regular pressure relief valve uses an internal pilot line that monitors pressure on the input port. Other than that, they're exactly the same and largely perform the same function, albeit unloading valves are considerably more flexible given their remote external pilot line can be used to sense pressure at various points within a larger hydraulic system. We'll examine this feature in a moment. Unloading valves, like pressure relief valves, are normally closed valves that open when pressure in the pilot line exceeds the adjustable set value. Unloading valves, like pressure relief valves, do not require check valve bypasses because they're ordinarily employed in regions with unidirectional flow paths. Unloading valves, like pressure relief valves, use an internal drain since their output port is customarily hooked to low tank pressure. Finally, unloading valves, like pressure relief valves, are customarily found next to a pump. Note, unloading valves can either be direct or pilot operated. Customarily, the input or primary port is labeled P for pressure. The output or secondary port is labeled T for tank. Let's call the external pilot line port X. The classic application example of unloading valves used since the first caveman invented the first unloading valve is a high-low pumping circuit. Note high-low is sometimes spelled as would a homeschooled teenager. A high-low pumping circuit is an economical solution to those applications that necessitate high flow at high pressures. The rarest and most expensive in the world is one that produces high flow at high pressures. However, one can easily economically purchase an inexpensive pump that produces high flow at low pressures, or just as easily one that produces low flow at high pressures. An unloading valve used with a pair of complementary inexpensive pumps can yield the desired high flow at high pressures. Allow me to demonstrate. A basic high-low pumping circuit consists of two pumps in parallel with a check valve in between. Pump B on the right is the one that is capable of generating low flow at high pressures. Let's say pump B can only generate 0.5 gallons per minute. However, it can do so up to 2,000 psi. A real pump performance chart would obviously see flow rate slope downwards at higher pressures. However, for this application, assume it has a perfect flatline response. Pump A on the left, in contrast, is the one that is capable of generating high flow at low pressures. Let's say pump A can generate a much larger 4 gallons per minute of flow. However, it can only do so up to 500 psi. Again, a real pump performance chart would obviously demonstrate flow rate slope downwards at higher pressure. However, for this application, assume it has a perfect flatline response. Note the check valve's orientation prevents pump B from forcing fluid backwards through pump A. However, pump A can still provide flow to the system. The main pressure relief valve serves to limit system pressure to let's say 1000 psi. The unloading valve therefore serves to unload pump A only. However, its remote pilot line senses pressure on the main pressure line leading to the system. Let's say the unloading valve is set to 500 psi. If you're up to the challenge, by all means pause the lecture and see if you can predict how this system operates inside the 0 to 1000 psi range. For load induced conditions inside the range of 0 to 500 psi, both the unloading valve and main pressure relief valve are closed. Both pump A and pump B are providing pressurized flow to the circuit, and flow rate to the system is respectable 4 plus 0.5 or 4.5 gallons per minute. As load induced conditions beget increased pressure in excess of 500 psi, the unloading valve opens and dumps pump A's 4 gallons per minute output to tank at low pressure. Pump A has been effectively switched out of the system and remaining high pressure flow is the responsibility of pump B. Beyond the 500 psi transition point, flow rate drops to 0.5 gallons per minute. However, given pump B's increased pressure range, the reduced output is valid up to 2000 psi. Well before we reach this upper limit, the main pressure relief valve opens up at 1000 psi and all flow is diverted to the tank. Do you see what this high-low pumping circuit is doing? As the title implies, it creates two operational regions for a hydraulic circuit. One, a low-pressure, high-flow mode, characterized by quick, yet comparatively weaker actuator movement, and two, a high-pressure, low-flow mode, 
characterized by slow, yet comparatively stronger actuator movement. Given the two operational regions, a high-low pumping circuit operates the actuator as quick as it can below the unloading valve setting. However, beyond this transition point, it drops it into low gear and really crushes it. This could be used to great advantage in a number of industrial applications. The two most obvious scenarios being one, when an unloaded actuator must rapidly approach an object using low pressure, high flow mode, and only upon contact apply force using the high pressure, low flow mode. Then two, after an actuator has broken the static friction of a heavy load using the high pressure, low flow mode, switch over to low pressure, high flow mode to keep it rolling. The classic example befitting a high low pumping circuit is that of a log splitter. Consider a 16 inch log that needs to get split by a cylinder with a 24 inch rod. The first eight inches of travel is essentially time wasted just getting the wedge to make contact before pressure needs to be applied. Therefore, the first eight inches of travel should be made using the high flow, low pressure mode. Once the wedge makes contact, pressure rises to that of the unloading valve. Beyond this transition point, the circuit drops it into low gear and splits the log using the low flow, high pressure mode. For those knowledgeable of regenerative extension, a topic examined in the regenerative extension lecture, you'll immediately recognize similarities. A high low pumping circuit making use of an unloading valve basically performs the exact same function as regenerative extension with some subtle differences that depending upon your perspective can be characterized as advantages or disadvantages. First, a regenerative extension circuit is less hardware intensive. All a regen circuit requires is a valve with a regen position or pilot operated check valves. The disadvantage with regenerative extension, as the name implies, is that it is suitable only for extension meaning the other half of the actuator cycle, retraction, happens with no special urgency. A high-low pumping circuit, in contrast, requires more hardware, notably two pumps, a check valve, and an unloading valve. However, it allows both extension and retraction to occur at two different flow rates. Regardless of methodologies, even when these disadvantages are taken into consideration, it sure beats the alternative. An application necessitating high flow at high pressures, making use of a single pump, capable of this, it's going to break the bank because such pumps are not only notoriously expensive, but also as hard to find as a good restaurant in Spokane, Washington. High low pumping circuits and regenerative extension circuits yield comparable results, yet are far, far cheaper. Before we move on to the next application example, let me make a brief point about external pilot lines and unloading valves. Note for this circuit, when pressure in the external pilot line is above 500 PSI, the unloading valve opens and dumps pump A's flow to the tank at low pressure. Again, pressure to the right of the check valve and pressure in the external pilot line is above 500 PSI. However, when the unloading valve is signaled to open by the external pilot line above 500 PSI, it dumps pump A's output to the tank at low pressure. Pump A, as the name implies, is unloaded at low pressure, thereby contributing to the efficiency of this larger hydraulic system. Moving on, consider other applications of unloading valves. In this scenario, the external remote pilot line of an unloading valve is monitoring pressure on an accumulator downstream of a check valve. When pressure in the accumulator is in excess of the unloading valve set value, the unloading valve would open and the pump is unloaded at low pressure and the circuit operates solely off the accumulator. The unloading valve therefore frees the prime mover from excessive loads during long idle times. Again, note pressure above stream of the check valve would be in excess of the unloading valve set value. However, when the unloading valve opens, the pump is unloaded at extremely low tank pressure. This is in contrast to the behavior of the main pressure relief valve, which relieves pressure at its setting when it experienced at its input. The main pressure relief valve in this circuit only serves as an emergency backup for conditions above that of the unloading valve. When pressure in the accumulator drops below the set value, the unloading valve recloses and the pump supplies pressure to the circuit. In summary, this circuit unloads the pump when the accumulator is charged and excess input is not required. During these idle times, the pump is unloaded at low pressure. You'd think this would be a great application of an unloading valve, but it isn't because of a tiny, annoying technicality. No unloading valves, like pressure relief valves, can either be direct or pilot operated. 
a direct acting unloading valve could theoretically make the circuit work. However, a pilot operated unloading valve would induce an annoying oscillation serving no other purpose than to drive you mad. A pilot operated unloading valve is similar to a pilot operated pressure relief valve and then a small dart inside the pilot section is unseated when exposed to pressure conditions in excess of the set point. When the pilot dart unseats, note a small quantity of pilot fluid can leak through the pilot section, which eventually drains the accumulator to below the reset value of the unloading valve. The pilot dart reseats, the unloading valve recloses, and the pump provides pressurized flow and pressure rises to the unloading valve set value, at which point the pilot dart unseats again and the whole annoying cycle repeats itself. Long story short, don't do this because it most likely won't work and other valves and circuits can unload pumps far more reliably. To overcome this complication, consider a related device known as a differential unloading relief valve. As the title implies, a differential unloading relief valve is a combination of an unloading valve and a pressure relief valve and measures the pressure differential between two points. Differential unloading relief valves use two pilot lines one checking pressure above stream of a check valve, and another below stream. Note differential unloading relief valves ordinarily house all these devices in the same valve body. Differential unloading relief valves are designed to work with accumulators and will unload a pump once the accumulator charges to a certain high level and keep it unloaded until the accumulator discharges below a certain low level. Allow me to demonstrate. Differential unloading relief valves make use of not one, but rather two pilot darts. One is above stream of the check valve and it works just like the pilot dart in the pilot section of the pilot operated pressure relief valve. Let's say this value is 1000 PSI. Recall that when the pilot dart in a pilot operated pressure relief valve unseats, the primary P2T passage would open. The second pilot dart in differential unloading relief valve is below stream of the check valve and it's slightly different than the first and that it has a larger surface area, upwards of 15 to 30% more, and when unseated, steps on the face of the first pilot dart. This unfriendly interaction is key to the performance of a differential unloading relief valve, as we'll learn in a moment. Given the larger surface area, this second pilot dart will unseat at pressures 15 to 30% lower than the first. This is the low setting of the accumulator. Let's assume this value is 850 PSI. When the system is initially discharged and powered on, the pump begins charging the accumulator through the check valve. Pressure in the upstream pilot chamber acts on the front side of the first pilot dart and the back side of the second and keeps the pair separated. At 1000 PSI, the first pilot dart unseats and several things happen at once. First, the primary P2T passage opens and unloads the pump at low pressure. Second, the check valve closes, preventing accumulator bleed down. Finally, given pressure is no longer acting on the back side of the second pilot dart, but rather accumulator pressure is acting on the larger front side, the second pilot dart unseats and steps on the first pilot dart's face like a rowdy hooligan at an English soccer riot. By keeping the first pilot dart unseated, the second pilot dart therefore overrides the first pilot dart's pressure setting. The accumulator is now fully charged at 1000 PSI and the pump is unloaded at low pressure. The system can now be operated solely off the accumulator inside a given range. If pressure in the accumulator ever falls below 850 PSI, the second pilot dart reseats itself and given it's not stepping on its face anymore, allows the first pilot dart to reseat. The primary P2T passage recloses and the accumulator begins charging again up to 1000 PSI. The process repeats itself. Long story short, the pump charges the accumulator up to 1000 PSI. At this point, the differential unloading relief valve unloads the pump at low pressure and keeps it unloaded until pressure in the accumulator drops below 850 PSI. At this time, the pump recharges the accumulator up to 1000 PSI thereby keeping the accumulator inside a differential range of 1000 to 850 PSI. Note the magnitude of the differential range is a byproduct of the fixed area differential between the second and first pilot dart, and customarily only the fully charged value is adjustable. 
if the second pilot dart is 15% bigger, it will be a 15% differential between the charged and discharged accumulator pressure. Whereas, if the second pilot dart is 30% bigger, there will be a 30% differential between the charged and discharged accumulator pressure. In this scenario, we're assuming it's 15% differential. However, if we were to use a differential unloading relief valve with a 30% area differential, and this scenario would result in the accumulator operating between 1,000 and 700 psi. Unloading valves and differential unloading relief valves need not be the only means a pump can be unloaded. Consider a simple pressure switch used as a sensor device. When pressure exceeds the set value of the pressure switch, the electrical contacts can be used to perform several actions, all of which serve to unload the pump. First, the pressure switch can be used as a sensory device which signals an additional normally closed directional control valve to shift into the open position. This solenoid actuated directional control valve is in effect acting just like an electrically actuated unloading valve and the pressure switch is acting just like the pilot line. When the pressure switch is activated by pressures in excess of its set value, the solenoid actuated directional control valve shifts to the open position and unloads the pump at low pressure. The check valve orientation prevents accumulator bleed down. When pressure falls to the reset value of the pressure switch, the solenoid actuated directional control valve returns to the spring offset closed position and the pump charges the accumulator. This alternative pump unloading scheme necessitates the solenoid operated normally closed directional control valve be rated to carry full pump flow. Second, the pressure switch can be used as a sensory device which signals an additional normally closed directional control valve to vent the main pressure relief valve. Similarly, the pressure switch is acting just like a pilot line, only this time the vented main pressure relief valve is acting just like an unloading valve. When the pressure switch is activated by pressures in excess of its set value, the solenoid actuated directional control valve shifts to the open position and vents the main pressure relief valve. The pump is unloaded at low pressure and the check valve on the accumulator prevents accumulator bleed down. When pressure falls to the reset value of the pressure switch, the solenoid actuated directional control valve returns to the spring offset closed position which closes the main pressure relief valve and the accumulator charges. The only difference between this implementation and the previous being that the solenoid operated normally closed directional control valve needs to only carry pilot flow, whereas the main pressure relief valve carries the full relief flow. Finally, far more sensible and simple than all of these other options we've thus far discussed is to use the pressure switch to turn off the prime mover driving the pump when pressure is in excess of the set point. I mean, really, why are you pumping at all when the pressure is already too high? Turn the pump off. It's noisy and it wastes energy. When pressure falls to the reset value, the pressure switch can always be used to turn the pump back on. We'll discuss the electrical aspects of pump unloading using ladder logic in later lectures on electrically controlled hydraulic systems. As a sample, here are extremely simple representations of a pump unloading ladder logic governing these three types of systems. This might be nonsense to you right now, but it is a preview of what is just around the next corner, coiled and waiting to strike. For now, you should understand that these implementations, making use of solenoid actuated directional control valves, are all essentially doing the exact same thing as an unloading valve. When shifted into the open position at the request of a sensory device like a pressure switch, they are diverting pump flow at low pressure and contribute to the efficient operation of a larger hydraulic system. All right, that's about it. Other lectures examine the remaining members of the pressure control valve family. Until then, that's all I've got for you. In conclusion, this lecture introduced unloading valves and examined unloading valve applications. We examine high-low pumping circuits, introduce the differential unloading relief valve used exclusively for accumulator circuits, and examine alternative pump unloading configurations making use of pressure switches and solenoid actuated directional control valves to either divert flow vent the main pressure relief valve, or simply turn off the prime mover driving the pump. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again in the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.